Hi, I'm Rob Pometeer. I'm one of the co-authors of the book, Marketing Strategy Based on First Principles and Data Analytics. In this session, we're going to go through Chapter 5. Chapter 5 is still looking at Market Principle 3, which is all competitors react, so you have to manage brand-based, in this case, we're going to talk about brand-based sustainable competitive advantage. The agenda we have for today is first we're going to talk about brands as a SCA, or a sustainable competitive advantage. We'll go through the basics, the architecture, and brand e extensions. Then we'll look at the three steps of building brand equity, and then finally we'll end with research approaches to understanding and managing brand equity. First, looking at brand basics. The American Marketing Association, what do they define brands as? Define brands as the name, term, symbol, or any other feature that identifies one seller's goods or services as distinct from those of others. So if you think of Apple computer, you have Apple as the name, you have the half-bitten Apple or the partially-bitten Apple on the back of all their laptops, for instance. You might have, um, in the past, you might even have a, a spokesperson, somebody like Steve Jobs would represent and be linked to the brand. So those all would be parts of the brand. Usually we describe a brand by looking at all the elements associated with it. And we continue with the Apple example, we would look at how does Apple ship products? They ship them in a nice box with very clean and sleek lines. That's part of their brand image. All of that goes together. If you think of BMW, you would think of something like the ultimate driving machine. Very often there's jingles or even musics associated with it. And brand equity as one form of sustainable competitive advantage and actually helps build the overall customer equity at a firm represents very often a large part of the value of a company. Let's just look through this list of brand value of the 10 most valuable global brands. And these are in billions of dollars. So we have $118 billion from the US is Apple. Google's number two at 107. Another US company, we're going to package good, Coca-Cola, IBM, Microsoft, GE, Samsung. So really the first non-US firm is from Korea is Samsung, Japan is Toyota, McDonald's, and Mercedes-Benz. So you can see very often brand equity represents a large portion of a firm's value. Brands are uh, very often one of the firm's most critical assets. Here's a couple um, statements. I think it makes the case very well. We look at the first. John Stewart was a 20-year CEO of Quaker Oats. And he said, here's a quote, if this company were to split up, I would give you the property, plant, and equipment, which is interesting about that. Those are the things that accountants would put on the firm's balance sheet and would be reported in their SEC filings. And I would take the brands, trademarks, and I would fare better than you. Also interesting, these brands and trademarks often are not even included on the firm's balance sheet. So what we see, here's the CEO saying, hey, what's the real value of this firm? It isn't the manufacturing capabilities of making some of their products. It's the brand names and the trademarks and the image associated with it. Another example provides, if you look at SEAs of firms, how to displace, if you were given the task, how would you displace Coca-Cola or Apple Computer? Coke is a good example because it would probably only take a few million dollars to come up with a soft drink of in a blind taste test that could beat Coca-Cola. So only a few, dollar, a few million dollars of R&D, but where is the real value? Where is the sustainable competitive advantage? What makes it tough to knock out Coca-Cola? It's that image of the brand that's in everybody's minds around the world. And why do people like brands? Brands help a firm end relationships, what we'll talk about later, from enduring customer loyalty. These are some of the things enduring customer loyalty gives you. A price premium. Coca-Cola, BMW, if you think of a lot of those firms with high brand equity, they're able to achieve higher price points for the exact same product. Toyota can get significantly more, um, they can charge significantly more for a product, a car, even though Hyundai maybe has an identical car, um, Toyota can usually get 10 to 20% price premium. Why? Because of their brand equity. Positive attributions. Pottage attributions is the idea that when something happens, here's a for instance, let's say Apple Computer, which has very high brand equity, let's say they ship late, and this has actually happened. They ship late because of supplier problems in China. The headline is, suppliers, Chinese suppliers um, fail to ship on time to Apple. 
So in other words, they don't blame Apple, they attribute the problem to the subcontractor or the manufacturer. If that same thing happens to Walmart, it'll be the headline will read, Walmart ships late. In other words, Walmart doesn't have his brand equity, so everybody attributes the problem straight to the firm. Where if you have a good brand, think of it as an individual, somebody with a very trusting relationship, trusting reputation, they don't get attributed with the problem. It gets put to another cause. It's much easier to cross sell and it's easier to retain customers when you have brand equity. And overall, as we showed in an earlier session, it generates high CLV, high customer lifetime value. It gives you higher margin, less money in order to, less cost to bring in new customers, higher levels of retention. They all lead to higher customer lifetime value. So brands as an SCA. Overall, what generates, what is it about a brand that generates an SCA? One thing that generates it is just when people have the knowledge about it and the awareness of it. They're walking down an aisle and they wanna buy a product, any kind of product in the grocery store. If that product's at the top of your mind, you're much more likely to grab it. So awareness is one of the drivers. Another driver of it is the brand image associated with it. That image is the positive linkages associated. Maybe for BMW, you have linkages of a, of a well-engineered automobile. So awareness and image are some of the things that lead into brand equity. How do we define brand equity? It's a set of assets and liabilities linked to a brand, its name and symbol, which add to or subtract from the value provided by the firm. So recognize too, while we talked about all these positive brands, brands can also subtract from the value of the firm. And where does brand equity lie? I mentioned this earlier, it lies in the minds of the customers. And that's why it's so hard to duplicate. That's what makes it sustainable. Just think back to that Coca-Cola example. How hard would it be to go out and get the same level of awareness in the world for a new soft drink? I mean, I don't know the number, but there's a large percentage of the people in the world know about Coca-Cola. To duplicate that level of awareness would spend billions of dollars. And then you not only have to make them aware, you have to anchor to that a good image, positive, positive experiences, a positive feeling. In order to have those positive linkages, again, it would take many, many billions of dollars in order to do that. And that's what we really mean by brand equity. Um, <clears throat> but one of the downsides of brand equity is that the same thing that makes it difficult for a competitor to duplicate also makes it hard for a firm to change their positioning. And this happens in Volvo right now. Volvo is a company, car company, Swedish car company that focused on safety for a long period of time. Now they want to shift their image because almost every car company has safety. And they say safety is no longer able to drive business. So we want to increase and make it more performance oriented, more sporty oriented. The problem is once you have an image as a certain brand, it's very hard to change that image. There's a lot of inertia associated with that brand. And so the same thing that makes it hard to duplicate for competitors makes it hard to change for a firm. Now we're gonna go through how does brand building work? How does it work in your mind? And this is a, um, a model. It's kind of called the Associative Network Memory Model of Brand Equity. And there's been lots of research done on this and it seems to capture, maybe it doesn't exactly represent what happens in your brain, but if it's a metaphor for what happens in your brain, it seems to be very accurate because how it works holds up to this. So let's go through and use an example of BMW. The way this memory model works is that when you think of awareness, and we typically measure awareness two ways. We ask aided and unaided recall. Unaided recalls, I say, name me five car manufacturers. And you go, one, two, three, four, five, you name them. You know, Toyota, BMW, Mercedes, each of those came to your mind unaided. How quick those come to mind is represented by a node in your brain. The bigger the node reflects how easy you are to re recall it. Sometimes for things that are very hard for people to recall, we use a technique called aided recall, and we give you a list of 20 names and say which ones of these are car manufacturers. And there might be some fake words in there, and if you can, you list those, and that would be unaided recall. Obviously, it's a much weaker measure. Typically, pe people use um, unaided recall. So the size of the node represents how easy it is for you to remember it. And the more you see advertisements, you see the word in a, in a TV advertisement, you might see it on a billboard, it makes that node bigger. 
because it brings it. It's the same way it works when you study for a test. As you keep seeing the material, it makes it bigger and that makes it easier to remember. Okay, so then we have links. We have these links to other nodes in your brain. The thickness, first building the link and the thickness of the link represents how easy it is to link these two nodes. So if I bring up the word to you BMW and you start thinking of product attributes really quick, like, oh, it's um, very nice looking, good looking car, well engineered. Those things, those memories that are linked to it are represented by the thickness of the node. So how do we get product attributes? We typically generate product attributes through product design. But let's look at another thing, advertisement. If I spend a lot of advertisement on the ultimate driving machine, and when I say BMW, you think of the tagline ultimate driving machine, that meant when this node was fired, this linkage was thick enough that it also made this node fired. So again, if you think of your example in a test, when you see a test problem, you say, oh, this is that type of problem. And as soon as you think of that type of problem, things are fired if hopefully one of those is the solution and the answer. And if you did enough studying, that would make that link thick enough. Typically these, what we have in light blue here, are the strategies firms do in order to generate these attributes. So good product design generates nice product attributes. Advertising links in ad line. And there could be some negative linkages too. In this case, I give an example of grandpa's car. Probably a lot of, probably BMW would not want the linkage when you heard the word BMW to think of, oh, you mean grandpa's car. That's kind of an older car. Now, I don't think that's probably the case for BMW, but that would be an example. Another linkage could be, oh, it's a German manufacturer. Now, here's an in interesting example. Let's talk about it. There was a movie placement, Skyfall, where, they, where BMW paid $25 million to the movie producers in order to have James Bond drive a BMW. Why did they pay that money? $25 million is a lot of money to have somebody just use a car. They probably gave them the cars for free also. Why did they do that move me place? Well, what BMW figured out is in their target market, the people they were going after, they liked the attributes of James Bond. Potentially some of these people are, are mid-aged men who wants to um, kind of be like a James Bond, at least in their mind. They want to be sophisticated, they want to be a ladies' man, they maybe want to be athletic. All of these linkages are all linked to James Bond over all the past movies. So BMW doesn't have to worry about that. That comes all prepackaged. So all the movie placement does is build that link. If they can have James Bond drive that car for two hours in a movie, that makes that link very thick. So now when I hear the term BMW, it fires this link to ultimate driving machine, that comes from the advertisement. It drives this link to James Bond from the movie placement, which also brings up these attributes. So it makes these three attributes get linked to BMW. That could be a very cost effective way to do it because if you had to do each of these individually, kind of like building these kind of links, you'd have to spend a lot of money on advertising. There is another advantage on a movie placement and why you're gonna see more movie placements in the future. And that is, over time, we've been bombarded with advertising. And because of that, we built mechanisms. One of them is just a, a basic psychological principle called reactance. When I try to persuade you to do something, you push back and you, you don't accept that. You almost react against it and take the opposite view. Kind of think of what teenage kids do when you tell them to do something. That's reactance. But when you watch it in a movie placement, it doesn't trigger reactance. Why? Because you're sitting there, you're enjoying yourself, he's driving a car, they're not really selling to you, it just is happening in the background. So in many ways, a movie placement is a more subtle way to make those linkages to ladies, man, athletic, and sophisticated than trying to get those same linkages directly through advertisement. So overall, this model of how advertising works, or I should say how brand equity works, holds up very well in many, many different kinds of tests. So even if it's not exactly right, it seems to be how it works. And the thing to remember on this is the size of the node represents how quick it can be, how easy it can be recalled, and then you build linkages to other nodes. And if I hit you with the word BMW, 
first it reminds, and then it links to all these other, and those are all the, the attributes associated with the brand. So when you're building a brand, and later when we go through the steps for building a brand, this is what we do. We try to build awareness first, and we link to it the attributes that our target market wants. And that's part of our positioning strategy. Okay, so this just summarizes what I kind of described to you a little bit. Let's go through it quick. Um, this memory model is a leading psychological model for how brands work. And we talked about brand awareness or familiarity being the size, image being the length. And brand strategy resolves around first building awareness or that anchor point, and then making the linkages associated with it. Okay. Here's another experiment. It's done very well, very often, and it's, it's kind of interesting. And it it's resolves around beer. And so what they do is first they give you beer, and you have the label on the beer, and you drink it, and you have to judge it on two attributes. And I don't have them here, but the two attributes would be these two axes. And you see in this perceptual map, when I ask you to judge the beer on, let's say, lightness and flavor, you have the beers spread out quite a bit. So you perceive these beers tasting different. However, I do the same test again, but I put the beer in glasses and I don't tell you the brand name. What do we see different? Look at how all these brands are together. These are not statistically different. The majority of the people cannot taste the difference on these two attributes on these five beers. Now they can tell Guinness is different and that's almost just a test. You can just look at Guinness. It's a lot darker and thicker, obviously. So what does this tell us? Well, it's a very interesting thing on how brands work. They don't just work by giving you status and such, which sometimes they do, but they actually change the taste of the beer. They change the taste of the beer. Now, how does that work? Well, come to find out there's a part of your brain that is what you evaluate for taste. And there's two inputs to this part of your brain. One input comes from your palate. When you taste the beer, it comes from your palate and it feeds to that center of your brain. And that's, what does it taste like? How light, what is the flavor like? But there's another part of your brain that feeds it. That part that feeds it is your brand awareness, your brand image. So your brain knows what that beer should taste like, or at least what the marketers have told you it would taste like. Both of those inputs come into your brain and that's what you perceive. That's what you perceive. So what you perceive is not just the real taste. You perceive the real taste merged with what you think the beer should taste like. And that's why if you see the brand, it tastes different to you. And this doesn't just work for beer. It works on all sorts of things. When you put something, when you pay that extra price to buy a Tiffany jewelry piece and it's delivered to your partner, if you will, in a turquoise bag, and they put on the, let's say it's a, a diamond engagement ring. When they look at that ring for the rest of their life, potentially, if they have a very good image of Tiffany, two things goes in on how they feel about that ring. One is the look of it and sparkle, the size, whatever. And the other is the brand image that Tiffany has built around their jewelry. So they'll actually enjoy looking at the ring more if there's a good brand associated with it. If there, and it is whatever the um, image that's anchored to that brand. So when you drive a BMW, if I just got done watching the movie Skyfall and I happen to want to be sophisticated athletic ladies man and I, and I know the ad about ultimate driving machine, when I actually drive the car, I enjoy driving the car more, not just on how it handles and how it feels in the seat, but also by my image in my mind about what I think I should be feeling when I'm driving that. So brands are very subtle. They work not only kind of more transparently with status and, and things like that, but they also work, if you will, subconsciously. And it's one of the things that makes brands very powerful. So what are some of the benefits of brand equity? Brands can change customers' actual experience, as we spoke about, how to drive a car, coffee shop, diamond jewelry. Some of the um, research has shown that they also make impact on financial performance. It drives sales growth. Sales benefit from strong brands because brands make it easier to acquire new customers. When you go out to buy a new car, let's say you've got a big promotion and you used to drive, let's say, a Ford or a Honda or something, Toyota, and now you're going to go out and you want to get a, a more luxury sporty car. 
when you walk into that BMW lot, are you worried if this car is going to break down? Are you worried if this car is going to go out of business? Are you worried if this car is, is not going to be well built? No, if you have a good brand, you perceive less risk, higher quality, and better performance. If you walked into a car dealership and you never heard of the brand in your life, you're going to, be, you're going to perceive a lot more risk. You don't know how it's going to perform. You don't have that image in your mind. So it drives sales. It drives sales both because it makes people more loyal and it also acquires new customers. It increases profit. Why does it increase profit? You're able to achieve higher prices. Tiffany's able to achieve higher prices. BMW's higher prices than just this base product. Why? Because they built this image that people want and you can charge more. And many of the luxury brands spend a lot of money to build this image because they know they need that. Loyalty effects. Loyalty effects is really probably what we speak of most when we um, think of a sustainable competitive advantage. It makes it much harder to knock off for a competitor to come in and replace it. If you look at somebody who's really loyal to a BMW or really loyal to Apple computers, do you think it would be hard to come in and say, oh, here's a, a different brand and it's $1,000 cheaper, let's say it's a car, or it's $100 cheaper and it's a smartphone or laptop, would you want to switch? In most cases, if that person has a strong brand, the loyalty will prevent people switching, even in the cases when it financially makes sense. Okay, the next thing we're gonna talk about, talk about kind of in, in the brand space, we talk kind of how it works, awareness and image. Now we're gonna talk about architecture. What is brand architecture? Brand architecture is how you put all your brands and a firm together. So let's look at it. It defines both the rationale and the structure among the firm, its products, and its brands. So if you think of Apple, they have iPad, iPod, iPhone, they have Max, Air Mac, they have a lot of different brands. What is their strategy and how they put it together? So there's usually two extremes. At one extreme is what we call a house of brand architecture. A house of brand, and I think an easy way to think of it is every, every product a firm that's used this architecture launches has a different brand. Let's think of Procter & Gamble. You don't see many advertisements for Procter & Gamble where they come out and say, Tide Procter & Gamble soap. No, they come out and pr promote Tide soap. So every product Procter & Gamble promotes, they do under the individual product's brand. Let's compare that to a branded house architecture, General Electric. General Electric uses a branded house. Every product they launch, they say, this from General Electric. They, use, they sold light bulbs, General Electric. They sold aircraft engines, General Electric. They sold, roof, they sold um, washers and dryers, General Electric, all under General Electric. So these are the two extremes. Now we'll talk about some in between that. The question is, why, should you, why would you do different ones? Typically, a firm should shift towards, you should start at a branded house because it's much more efficient. A branded house is the GE model. And why is that more efficient from a marketing standpoint? Because when they launch a new product and they say GE, GE XYZ, maybe it's a new home generator from GE, you immediately have the image in your mind of, oh gee, it's a good electronics firm, it, it has good products, it stands behind it, I'm not worried they're gonna go out of business, high quality. And so when they launch that product, you immediately are comfortable with it because it has the GE name. But if I launched it under a brand new name, you'd say, who is this? And that's what Procter & Gamble has to do. So it's a lot more cost, costly to launch brands under a new name. So typically you always do a branded house unless there's a reason or reasons to do separate brands. And what are some of those reasons that Procter & Gamble does it? And other firms too. One reason is if two brands can't go together in your mind. Let's say you want to sell toothpaste, Crest, and diapers, Pampers. If I had P&G toothpaste and P&G diapers, do you think the images, think back to that memory model, the images of diapers would you like that same image being linked to your toothpaste? No, you wouldn't. So they have to have separate names. You want to keep them separate because you want very different images in people's mind. 
Another reason is, when you go down to a grocery store and you look at all the laundry soap, in some grocery stores, 70% of the laundry soap is made by one company, Procter & Gamble. How do they get 70% of the shelf space at a grocery store? They do that because they have all these different brands. The consumer that walks by and looks at all these soaps, they don't see Procter & Gamble and everything. They see them as all different products in their own right. If they were all labeled under the Procter & Gamble brand, and you saw 70% of the shelves for, dish, all being, for laundry soap all being Procter & Gamble, you'd say, first, the store wouldn't even let you do that. You wouldn't be able to own that part of the market. So it allows you to expand to a bigger part of the market, each one with a different image. So these are the two extremes. Let's look at this graph of it. So at one is many independent brands, and that's a house of brands. At the other expand is a single master brand, and that's a branded house. As I described, P&G is Tide, Cheer, All, Ariel, Purex. Those are all brands under one company. Down here, GE, Airline, Appliances, Finance. Now, there are ways to do it in the center. And in the center are things like Marriott. Why did, and we call this an endorsed brand, why did Marriott, when they came out to go after a new target market with Courtyard for business travelers, they did Courtyard by Marriott. So they had to make a choice. They could have gone and just called it Courtyard, not even brought up the name Marriott. The advantage of that is if you had a Courtyard here in a Marriott, a full service Marriott next door, people would not see it as a, as a conflict or competitive. They would see them as two separate entities. So by doing by Marriott, they have to make sure that the full service Marriott that might cost twice as much is really a different experience than the courtyard. They need to separate those. But the advantage for them by doing it is as soon as you heard courtyard by Marriott, you say, oh, Marriott knows how to run hotels. So I bet this courtyard is also run well and has high quality. Now they made it very clear courtyard is targeting a different market. It's really for the business travel. And if you looked at their ads, it would have been very clear about that. And there's a sub-brand, Sony Walkman. That's where you have two, you have a, a sub-brand of the product and you put another, um, usually the parent name on top of it. Nestle Kit Kat would be another example. So these are ways to get a little bit of the benefits of both. You get some of the efficiency, Courtyard by Marriott got some of the efficiency of a branded house, but then it got some of the separation from a house of brands. So it achieved their objective. How we decide to put all our brands together, that's our brand architecture. Now let's talk about another brand strategy. These are brand, extent or brand extensions. And there's a number of different types of extensions. Typically they can be categorized into three different groups. And why do we even do brand extensions? We do brand extensions because it's a lot more efficient when we launch a new product and we want to expand the market. So let's think back to Crest. If I did a lot of work for Crest toothpaste and I built a very strong brand around Crest, maybe I could come out with Crest mouthwash. And I, I take some of that equity and brand in Crest and I link it to another product category. It allows me to grow the market. So let's go through our three types of extensions. One is brand line extensions, often called simple line extensions. The new offering is in the same product category. So in this case, it would be like Crest offering extra white toothpaste, toothpaste that makes your teeth white. It's still toothpaste, but it has a little added ingredient in it. Uh, maybe with a new flavor, mint taste flavored Crest. Those would be brand line extensions. Just a small set of attributes. Typically what you're doing in your target market, you're just putting other products around it. Many, many new products offered in the market fit into the brand line extensions. They're just small iterations. A bigger iteration is brand category extensions. This is a new offering that moves to a completely different category, like Crest mouthwash. Vertical. Vertical extensions are when you're trying to just move up and down the market based on the price point. So in a way, Courtyard by Marriott was a vertical extension where they tried to move down market at a lower price point to get to the business travel because some firms would not pay the expense of a full service Marriott and Marriott wanted to go after that market. So let's go through, I, I, I talked about Crest. Here's some example of 
line extensions, brand extensions, where they just add different ingredients in them. Typically, 99% of all the ingredients are the same. In many cases, these are more of a marketing effort than really a new product. Where brand extensions are these other products, sometimes called a brand category extension. They're trying to leverage that good, the equity in Crest into other categories. And when you hear that and say, geez, if they make good toothpaste, they probably can make good mouthwash too. It's related. Um, here's the example of the vertical extension. And Marriott's been very good at doing vertical extensions. They went from, if you go up market, JW is above the normal Marriott. They do courtyard, which is down. They have some suites and some of these have different attributes. So some of these are vertical extensions. Some are brand line extensions. Now here's an example of a line of an extension that did not work very well. Ford Motor Company bought Jaguar. And they said, wow, we can make a Jaguar a lot cheaper by placing it on a frame that was made by Ford and we're going to go down market. So they took a car that normally cost about $65,000 and had a lot of brand equity and status associated with it. And they launched it at the mid 30, 35,000, $38,000. So what's the problem about doing that? And this is the danger in, in line extensions, in vertical extension. This was the problem. Let's say you've really wanted to Jag your whole life. You saved your money. You went out and bought a Jaguar. You bring it into your driveway, you're polishing it, you show it to your neighbor, and you say, yeah, look at this nice Jag, and you kind of feel good about that. You have a little status, Jag has a status. And then a week later, your neighbor brought, buys a Jaguar for about half the price you did, drives it in the neighbor and said, yeah, I have a Jag now too. How does that make you feel? You say, wow, you took away my brand equity. It's the reason that Tiffany does not have sales. If you want to really maintain that exclusivity, that high-end luxury brand, you can't be selling it cheaper because it undermines it for people. Because then when you drive it around, everybody's going to wonder, do you have the kind of the cheap version of the brand? Buy it on sale. The other thing I think if you look at it, I would say if you look at this part of the car, what does that look like? It kind of looks like a Taurus. Well, that's part of the problem too. If people are going to be confused between your Jaguar and a Taurus, they have very different brand images. And this was a real um, disaster. They, took, they lost a lot of brand equity by trying to go drown market. Okay, what is the advantages of brand extensions? Why do firms do them? It accelerates new product acceptance. Can you all see how Courtyard by Marriott would make Courtyard more accepted to business travelers than just Courtyard, which is a brand new name? It lowers the cost of the new launches. It doesn't take as much advertising because if you go back to that memory model, as soon as you say buy Marriott or it's a GE product, all the attributes that are linked to that name automatically get linked to your new product. And that makes it less risky and more accepted. It reduces the time needed to build the brands, the new product's brand, because it uses a lot of those existing characteristics. Also, it's very often easier to go into retail stores if you have a big branded product, somebody knows it. If you go in with Ralph Lauren and you enter to a Nordstrom's or a um, Saks, that brand would be more accepted than if you had some product that nobody ever heard of before. It helps enhance the image of the parent. So sometimes when you launch the sub brand or the um, such, it'll actually help the um, parent brand. Do you think the iPhone as a brand helped Apple overall. Sure, it added brand equity to the parent name because it was a very successful product. So it bleeds upwards, if you will, to the parent brand. And it expands the size of the market. And this is often why firms do extensions. Why is Marriott going after all those? They go after suites, they go JW Marriott, they go down to Courtyard. They do that because they look at the overall hotel business and they say, okay, I'm doing pretty good right here, but I wanna go after that segment that segment and this other segment. So after they did that, if you will, market principle one and they segmented the whole market, first they went into one segment, but once they got pretty saturated in that, they started going with new products into other segments. So here's some guidelines from a whole many years of research on how to optimize brand line and vertical extensions. So the three types of extensions we talked about. First, consumers should perceive fit between the parent and the extension. 
It could be on product attributes, like um, fresh taste. If you went from a toothpaste to a mouthwash and you're talking about fresh taste, those attributes would cross. Uh, maybe it's a similar type of manufacturing. Honda Motors. Honda Motors had an attribute of being very competent making small engines. So they went, from, they went to motorcycles, they went to snowmobiles, they went to jet skis, they even went to aircraft engines. Not that they knew anything about aircraft, but they built whole aircrafts because they had good technology and engines. So that would be kind of a, a manufacturer. High quality brands stretch further, meaning if you have a lot of brand equity, you can jump into another category easier. easier. Brands seen as prototypical or difficult to stretch. Clorox soap. Clorox, what do you think of when you hear that? You think of bleach. They tried to come out with a brand category extension from bleach to soap. How many of you would want to have a soap to wash your face with called Clorox soap? No, because that Clorox has this bleach, this very aggressive, um, that you don't picture it doing very well on your skin. So those two things did not fit together. So that was a failed product launch because it did not fit. Concrete associations. You know, if you're a company and you're called Threaded Wheat, how can you come out with, you know, something different? Everybody hears the name. That's why firms like General Electric has changed their name to GE. Because a lot of their products have nothing to do with electric. IBM, International Business Machine. That you don't see that anywhere, International Business Machine anymore. IBM only goes by the letters IBM. Most new firms now are smart enough when they design their new name, they don't give it anything with a concrete association like international business machine. They just give it a word. Why? Because they know that word can be stretched however they want it to be made, rather than use words that limit them to an individual market segment, like General Electric and IBM. So they had to go through a brand name change um, because of that. If you want to extend your brand, you need to do it in steps. So if you're a lower end brand, you can't all of a sudden become a high end luxury brand. You need to move slowly, one step by others. Vertical extensions often hurt the parent. As we saw in Jaguar, when they came and they went down market to a $30,000, $35,000 Jaguar, it hurt the parent brand. Typically when you do that, you wanna upgrade the parent brand a little bit and make sure they don't overlap in attributes. If they overlap, people say, why wouldn't I just buy the cheaper product? It looks just like the more expensive product and that hurts the parent brand. Most successful advertising for extensions are based on information about the extension, not the parent brand. So when, Courtyard, when Marriott came out with Courtyard by Marriott, they didn't advertise about Marriott. They just let that sit there and they knew everybody would see it. They only advertised about Courtyard. They said, oh, it's set up very organized for a business person. Here's your room. It's easy to do. There's a little restaurant in it. Goes through the whole... They don't ever bring up anything about the parent brand. They know the parent brand will be pulled through. They're just trying to say, how is this different than the parent brand? Okay, we just finished, if you will, the basics brand as an SCA. We went through the basics, how architecture, branded house, house of brands, and all the different types of extensions. Now we want to go through the three steps of building brand equity. And some of these I've already alluded to. So let's think of it. The first thing you want to do, step one, what is the brand building activity? The first thing you're going to do is build a high level of brand awareness. And why are you doing this? This is building an anchor point. You can't start building, let's go back to our BMW example, and you can't start linking James Bond to something until you have BMW locked into people's mind. So the first thing I want to do if I'm launching a new brand is get out awareness, just the name. It won't have a whole bunch of baggage associated. It'll just be the name. So like when P&G came out with Swiffer, it's kind of the new mop idea. They did a lot about Swiffer. So that name would be easy to recall. That's the anchor point. Once you start getting your awareness level up to, in your target market to 30, 40, 50% or better, then you go to step two. Step two is linking that name that you have, that node that you have built into people's mind, linking it to the points of parity and the points of difference. And what do I mean by that? Points of parity are things that are the same as your competitors, but they're required. Let's say it's an automobile. Maybe required for automobile is that it's safe and it doesn't break down, it has good reliability. So you have to say, hey, our car is just as safe 
and just as reliable as all the other cars. Then you come out with points of difference. Points of difference would be how is your product better in some differential way, some relative advantage way than all the other ones out there. So maybe you could make it the driving experience is different. The flavor is better maybe if it's a, a product you would eat. And this defines your relative advantage. Remember, in order to have an SCA, you have to have a relative advantage. You have to make sure customers care about it too. Once you have, and these would be the images, the links you would build to your name. First you build the awareness and the name, that's the node, then you build the links. Some of those links would be parity, some of those links would be how you're gonna compete. The third step and last step is when you wanna build this emotional connection. Most of this works, if you will, and we call the kind of the cognitive part of your brain, thinking. If you have a really strong brand, it moves beyond thinking and it builds to the emotions. So we wanna build a deep emotional connection or relationship between the brand and the target. This generates powerful and long-lasting barriers. So I would think, and I know some of my colleagues that are just Apple fanatics. They would never ever buy a PC. They're just, they love Apple products. They've got emotionally attached to it. Everything they have, be it a cell phone, uh, a laptop and such is an Apple product. Well, once you get to that point, you've really locked the customer in. And I would think there's probably some people like that for BMW, some people probably really like Tiffany jewelry, and they might have some people, Hondas, that just really love the Honda automobile, and they're LinkedIn and very loyal. This takes a while to do, and you might do it in, in many different ways. Um, so those are the steps for building brand equity. Now the last thing we're gonna talk about in this session is what are the research approaches to understanding and measuring brand equity? Now in many cases, Big companies go out and hire firms, something like BAV is a firm, Interbrand is another firm. They are some of the largest firms in the world that measure brand equity. They'll do it around the world for your product in all the different countries, and they have ways to measure it that they've developed over time. One of the advantages of using these consulting firms is you, they have those numbers, we call them normed, they know how the scales are for all different brands. So when you get your measures back, you can compare it to how is my brand versus Apple? How is my brand in Apple in the UK, in Germany, in the US, in Australia versus Apple? So if you're competing against somebody, it's kind of a standardized measurement. But there is ways you can measure it internal too. So in order to track the effectiveness of returns on marketing expenditures, you need to measure brand equity over time. A company like Procter & Gamble, they measure brand equity for their big brands on an ongoing basis and they have a report card. So every quarter, they don't even look at how much money they make, they look at how's the brand equity of Tide Soap. If it starts dropping down, they put more money towards it. Different approaches, methods, and metrics for brand measuring brand health are available, depending on your objective. Typically, if you're starting for, from scratch, you would do something called a brand audit. You would go out, and there's a couple ways to do this, but one thing you usually start, you would start with qualitative research, something like a focus group. You'd get 10 or 12 people in a room behind one-way glass, and you would have a moderator ask them, here's a product, what do you think of this product? Let's say it's BMW, since we're using that example today, you say, here's a picture of a BMW. What, what do you think about a BMW? And if they said, high performance, German made, they're just replicating what you think the links are. But what if somebody brought up, oh, that's a yuppies car, I would never drive one. You'd say, wow, that has a negative attachment to our name. Now, if that person isn't in your target market, maybe you're okay with that. But let's say that person is in your target market. Let's say, for example, you're doing Buick and you're doing that focus group to try to understand your brand, which is evaluate the health and understand the strengths and weaknesses. It provides a foundation for building your structure. So let's say I ask about Buick and they say, oh, let's say everybody under 50 in the room said that that's an old person's car. You would know in that audit that there was a weakness or at least the linkage to that that said people at a certain age group are not gonna buy this car because they perceive it as a sign that it's uh, um, not for their demographic group. It's not cool for their demographic group. It's not appropriate. And we typically do this in qualitative. 
Once we understand about our brand using qualitative, then very often we'll do a survey. A survey would go out to a large random group of potential users, and you don't tell them that your BMW is surveying about BMW. You would say, We're, we'd like to know your opinion about five different brands of car. Audi, Mer Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Cadillac, whatever else you wanted to test, Jaguar. And you would have them measure on a scale how quality of engineering, high performance, status, you would have it measured across many different attributes. At the end of that, you could build a perceptual map and you would have a very nice picture of how your, br your brand stood up against its competitors. You can also do experiments. Experiments would be an idea where you would go in one, maybe you want to see how responsive is your brand to new advertisement. You might take two cities that are relatively similar where you're selling your product. In one of them, you do a bunch of advertising about a new image. Uh, maybe that it's super high quality. And then you would measure before and after the experiment in both markets. In the one you spent a lot of money in, you would say, okay, they'd start out at about the same side on, brand qual on quality, let's say, quality or performance. After you did a bunch of advertising, you'd measure them both, and you'd see how much did it raise my brand equity, and then you would look at how much do people more likely to buy it. And that would give you a feeling on how much, how responsive is brand equity to spending money, and how easy is it to link in and build another link or another image associated to the node, and then ultimately what's the effect on sales. For We have a lot more details on this in Data Analytic Technique 5.1 in the book. So what we did in this session, it was really still looking at, we know all competitors react, so we have to build sustainable competitive advantage. In marketing, there's really three ways to build sustainable competitive advantage. One is through brands, another is through offering, and the third is through relationships. What we went through now is how can you use brands to build sustainable competitive advantage so when competitors come after you, those brands can help withstand the attack. Thank you.